Come, let us raise a glass. Let us drink to this creature called man. Good and evil repeat in an endless cycle on the spiral of time, where a lifetime is far too long for peace, yet far too short for war. This is why they yearn. That is why they foster. If only they knew that all one needs in life is the sun, the soil, and poetry. The Chimera Ant arc is by far the most ambitious story told throughout all of Hunter x Hunter. Love it or hate it, this is the defining arc for this series as it encompasses 132 chapters of the manga and 61 episodes of the 2011 anime. From what I can tell, this arc is controversial in the Hunter x Hunter fanbase, there is a clear divide between people who love it and people who hate it, with of course many in between. Cards on the table, I love this arc. I think it's one of the best anime arcs I've ever seen. I appreciate the unique direction Sogashi chooses to take the story in and how dark things become. However, in this thematic breakdown for this arc, I'm not here to convince anyone why I think this arc is so great, nor is this a review of the story. Perhaps more overtly than any other storyline within this series, the Chimera Ant arc is chock full of themes and messages that Tagashi is trying to work through. In this video, I'm going to try and tackle the biggest themes in order to distill them into clear messages that I believe are vital to understanding what exactly the point of the vastly different Chimera Ant arc was. This is going to be a long one, but I hope you'll join me as we dive right in. In this arc, there are almost too many thematic elements present to even list. Most obviously, this arc is about man versus nature, but it is also about power, nobility, and governance. It is about maturity, grief, the value of ideals, and the very nature of evil itself. There are so many characters and plot points that the Chimera Ant arc becomes unwieldy if you try to take it all in at once. At first, I considered breaking this arc down in two parts, splitting the events from the only clear narrative dividing line I could find before and after the infiltration of East Quarteau. But I decided against that as I felt covering a larger amount of themes just for the sake of covering them would result in lower quality videos. So instead of breaking down as many themes as I can and diving into the minutia of each plot point, for this video, I want to focus on the four themes that I feel are the most important to fully understanding the narrative of the Chimera Ant arc. Processing grief, maturity, man versus beast, and how one changes in the face of malice, a perceived pure evil directed at oneself. Organizing my thoughts for this video is going to be a little tough since this arc is so sprawling, so please forgive me if I bounce around throughout the plot a bit as I provide evidence for my points. I'll try to make the context around my points as clear as possible for those who haven't recently watched or read this arc so that we can all be on the same page. These themes are also not entirely distinct from one another, and in order to understand one of them fully, an understanding of each element is vital. So, let me begin with the foundation for this entire arc, maturity. Maturity may seem like an odd theme to start this discussion off with, because this arc is really sold on being about a battle between hunters and crazy evolved mega ants. However, if you comb through this arc, you'll find example after example of characters on both sides of this conflict maturing in a way that informs their character development. The four most prominent characters who mature throughout this arc are the four youngest characters involved, Gon, Kilua, Yupi, and the King. Let's start with the Hunters. Gon and Kilua begin this arc coming right from Greed Island a massive real-world video game that they've spent the better part of a year training in and playing until they ultimately won. They are coming fresh off a childlike activity, given it was filled with danger, but at the end of the day, it was a game. That is to say, although they've had incredible success in their adventures, they are still children, hardened somewhat by experience, but still naive. Their story begins in this arc, with Gon reuniting with Kite after he'd last seen him years ago on Whale Island. Kite acts as an older brother figure for Gon, a disciple of his father's who started Gon's childhood desire to become a hunter. Kite quickly takes Gon and Kilua under his wing with a wacky assortment of young amateur hunters, and things seem to be going how Gon and Kilua's life experience would suggest, 
but there is a looming darkness growing in the background. It is only after the seriousness of the situation sets in that Gon and Killua are separated by those closer in age with them, and they are taken along with just Kite. Here, the difference in Gon and Killua's experience and age becomes a real plot point, with Kite acting as a mentor, but also a protector. Kite sacrifices himself in order to save the boys, losing an arm to Neferpito in front of them before Kilua takes Gon and runs away. From here on out, the boys are never around youthful characters again for the rest of this arc. In regard to their human allies, Gon and Kilua are by far the youngest involved in the plot. They are exclusively surrounded by adults or monsters. During their training under Biscuit, in order to defeat Knuckle and Shoot, Gon and Killua get stronger, but this is not really where their character developments that mature them come into place. It is only after their defeat, upon realizing that even after training, they still do not have what it takes to make it into the extermination team, that both Gon and Killua are given explicit plot points to show their maturity. Killua's is perhaps the most obvious. He is called out for being overly cautious in combat, always assuming the worst, and because of this, Biscuit states that he will leave Gon to die one day. Biscuit correctly points out that this habit was instilled in Killua by those who raised him, and it is something Killua will have to work on to overcome. After pushing himself in his fight with the weird panty bunny ant, Killua does overcome this problem. Although it's done in a way that I don't like very much, pulling a secret needle out of his brain planted there by his brother Illumi, Kilua's journey in this section is about overcoming the insecurities instilled in him by those who raised him, maturing into his own man, and he is better off for it. Gon, on the other hand, gets a much more lighthearted, or horrifically criminal, display of maturity, depending on how seriously you want to take things. This example is, of course, Gon's date with Palm, where Gon takes the lead and organizes a pretty lovely evening between the two of them. This is obviously meant to be as big a surprise to the audience as it is to Kilua. Gon has had no on-screen romantic interactions, and the typical shonen protagonist, especially a tween like Gon, is usually completely oblivious of the opposite sex. While this is a lighthearted example, showing that these boys are growing up, the real example of Gon's first step into maturity comes with the revelation of what Kite has become. Gon blames himself for Kite's condition and vows that he will take Pito on himself to avenge Kite. Gon's vow sends a chill down Knuckle, and Knuckle asks Kilua what the two did to change so much in such a short time. Kilua responds, Nothing really. They're the ones that changed us. For Gon and Kilua, this arc represents the loss of their innocence. The confrontation with the Chimera Ants forces the boys to mature in order to keep pushing forward. They react to their maturity in different ways, with Kilua maturing in order to become a more self-assured person and a better warrior, while Gon comes face to face with the harsh reality of the world and allows his loss of innocence to fuel a spiral of depression, anger, and self-hatred that will lead him quite literally transforming into an adult version of himself not long after. That is something I will speak to more specifically when the time comes. For now, let's shift focus to the ants. The Chimera ants are all essentially infants with fully formed bodies. They know nothing of the world or social interaction, they are born to serve their role in the ant hierarchical structure, and that is all there is to it. So, when considering the relative youth of these characters, it isn't surprising that a good portion of the story being told about them revolves around growing up and maturing. That is never clearer than with the characters of Yupi and Meruem. I won't touch on the king too much for now, since really, his entire arc is about personal growth and maturity of thought, but I think Yupi's arc is important to understand, as it also leads into another thematic element I will discuss next. We are told that Yupi is the only royal guard without any human DNA. He is some concoction of ant and magical beast, which is why he is able to shapeshift, but we are also told that is the reason why Yupi has the least sense of self out of the royal guards. He is an individual, but at the start of the palace invasion, he sees himself only as the role he serves, very similar to how the king viewed himself before Komugi asked what his name was. During his battle with Knuckle, Shoot, and Moral, Yupi matures in real time, and that maturity, which is explicitly stated by the narrative and given physical form in his Rage Incarnate transformation, leads him to developing a sense of self and individual identity. Due to the mental stress of dealing with the invaders, Yupi matures during his battles to the point that by the end of the fight, he shows respect and mercy to Moral and Knuckle. 
Coming under the stress of conflict, Yubi develops into the type of ant Knuckle never wanted to eliminate in the first place. By the end of the fight, he has become more human than ever before and upholds the agreement he made with Knuckle. This may seem ultimately unimportant, but I believe for Takashi to focus so explicitly on a character development arc of maturity for one of the main villains was done so for a purpose. That leads me to my next theme, how one changes in the face of pure evil. This theme is a bit wordier than the rest, and I'm sure there is a way to make a more concise point, but I think it's important to frame things around a larger message rather than just what is the nature of evil. I do not think Tagashi is claiming there is such a thing as pure good and pure evil based on how all the characters act within this arc. I began this video off with an excerpt from an in-universe poem about the nature of man, about his relationship to good and evil. This poem is introduced to the story at the very end of the arc. It is actually placed over a reveal that the real leader of East Gorto secretly retired 30 years ago and has been living in peace, which is interesting enough to dissect, but I'll leave that for another time. I believe this poem is meant to serve as the thematic wrap-up for the events that unfolded throughout the arc, but what is Tagashi trying to say? My interpretation is that man is both good and evil, that the life of man is so long and filled with both hardship and peace that man inevitably will act in ways that are both good and evil. It is an endless cycle that will go on for all time because it is the nature of man, and the poet laments this nature concluding that if only man would appreciate the sun, the soil, and of course, poetry, then his issues would be resolved. Personally, I think that last line is a little tongue-in-cheek, but you get the overall point. Evil is not a being that exists. Evil is behavior in a moment in time. Man has the capacity to be good or evil, and so too do the ants. And yet, we all know that when come face to face with inexcusable horrors done to us, we will forever view the assailant as pure evil. That is what I want to break down now, how people are completely transformed in the face of malice, a perceived pure evil directed at them. The four best characters to break this theme down are Gon, Yupi, Poof, and the King. Let's begin with our sweet young boy, Gon. Like I mentioned, Gon begins this arc as the innocent child that he has been throughout, yet, as Kilua states, he is forced to mature through his interaction with the Chimera Ants. Well, the trigger of this change in Gon is coming face to face with Neferpito as she lunges toward them, severing Kite's arm and ultimately killing him. Although Gon doesn't allow himself to believe Kite is truly dead until it is undeniable, it is this first contact with Pito that changes Gon for the rest of this arc. We are later told through Nove that the Nen aura the royal guards give off feels like it's filled with everything sinister in the world. Gon came face to face with something that felt so evil it caused an experienced hunter like Nove to have a complete mental breakdown just by seeing it. It is then safe to say that Gon perceived Pito as pure evil, and his later actions show as much as he is very much transformed for the worse by his contact with this malice. Gon, who we know as a very naive and generally friendly child, someone willing to give even enemies like Hisuka the benefit of the doubt, changes into a cold creature unwilling to show mercy when it comes to the Chimera Ants, but more specifically, Pito. The pure evil that Gon believes Pito embodies allows for a complete personality shift within him. Not only is he cold and vicious toward Pito, but he is focused and consumed by a darkness which drives him to not give Pito an inch of trust. First assuming that Komogi is a victim of Pito's, and then upon realizing she is valuable to Pito, Gon threatens the life of an injured girl on more than one occasion in order to get Pito to do his bidding. There is a lot more to analyze with Gon and his grief, which I will get to shortly, but I wanted to first point out that the tremendous and upsetting transformation we see from Gon in this arc comes only after he is faced with what he believes to be pure evil. The next example of Malice changing a character comes from the last seconds of the King's conscious thought before he is nearly killed by Netero. Now, Netero is a really interesting character who probably deserves his own video to explore, but for the sake of this topic, at the end of his life, Netero comes to embody pure malice directed at the King of the Ants. Netero claims that Meruem knows nothing of the bottomless malice of the human heart, and then detonates the nuke he had in his chest. Coming face to face with this bottomless malice, with this pure evil, Meruem feels fear for the first and only time in his entire life. 
The king has one clear thought before the explosion consumes him. The game was over before it even started. Unlike Gon, who changes for the worse due to his confrontation with evil, the experience is a humbling one for Meruem, although it is short-lived. We don't get to see how this malice would change him long-term because he is so damaged by it that he forgets the surrounding events. However, there are two characters who are drastically changed by the malice directed at their king, and by extension, themselves, Yupi and Poof. It is safe to say that the three royal guards' identities are wrapped up in their role as servants of the king, and they all care deeply about the king and his mission. So, an assault on the king is thus an assault on themselves, and when Netero detonated the Rose Bomb, Yupi and Poof both feared the worst about the king. They perceived the bottomless malice directed at the king, pure evil in the form of Netero, and they reacted accordingly. Unlike the king, who is humbled by the experience, Yupi and Poof both have similar reactions to Netero as Gon did to Pito. Do you remember all that talking I just did about Yupi maturing during his fight with the humans? Well, upon facing this evil, Yupi immediately regresses back to his original way of thinking. No longer does he harbor any respect or mercy for the humans, he tells Poof that he was wrong and that they should slaughter all of them. This is at the same time that Knuckle seeks to reason with Poof's segment, hoping that he can make similar inroads with him as he made with the mature Yupi. Upon arriving at the meeting ground, Knuckle looks upon Poof, who has physically changed in reaction to this perceived evil. Sheerly on instinct, half of his body regresses to look entirely like an ant. I think this final example says it all. This arc tells us that in the face of bottomless malice, when we feel that pure evil is directed toward us, we turn into monsters ourselves, forsaking our previous ideals for the sake of righting the wrongs done to us. We see through Gon, Yupi, and Poof that interaction with evil causes an equally horrific transformation within us, creating a vicious cycle on the spiral of time just as the poem describes. It is only the king, who had no time to change and is quite literally a superior being, that is able to find some humility and peace when faced with this evil, but this is part of the king's journey that I want to talk about in a bit. For now, the time has finally come to talk about Gon's journey through dealing with grief. I've talked about Gon a lot in this video so far, without focusing on him for too long, and that's because I think that his character arc within this storyline informs a lot of what Togashi was trying to say and deserves its own section. In short, Gon's journey in this arc involves all the elements that I have described up until now. It is about maturity, our reaction to evil, but it is all told through the framework of unbearable grief. There are many parallels drawn between Gon and the King, and Gon and the Ants in general throughout this arc. He was always shown to the audience as a bit of a wild boy, a child raised in nature with a deep connection to it, but this arc shows us something else. Attention isn't drawn to his acute sense of smell, or even his natural ability to use Zetsu he learned from watching animals. Attention is instead constantly drawn to his cold stare, to his focus on his prey, and to the chill he sends down everyone's spine. This is not the same boy we knew from the beginning of the series, or even from the end of the prior storyline. This is a person who is grieving without the toolkit for how to deal with it properly, and he suffers for it. I've covered a lot of Gon's early stages of grief with his maturity and the initial spark that set him down this path, and I will focus more on what Gon represents for the theme of man versus beast in the final section, but now, I want to take a closer look at Gon's behavior, starting with the moments before the palace invasion. One of the first verbalizations and overt hints to the audience that something is not right with Gon comes when Kilua theorizes that the king must have hurt himself, which is why Pito's end was turned off. Moral questions why someone would hurt themselves, and Gon says, when you can't forgive yourself. This is both a look into Gon's thinking, his guilt over what happened to Kite, but also foreshadowing Gon's complete lack of self-preservation toward the end of the story. Right before the palace invasion begins, we are also told that a shadow fell over Gon's eyes, something that only Kilua noticed. For the vast majority of the time spent in the palace, Gon actually doesn't get much dialogue nor narrative explanation. Instead, the audience is presented Gon's behavior through Kilua and Pito's perspectives. While we see that Gon is dedicated to the overall mission when he continues to charge directly at Yupi as the dragon dive arrows begin to crash through the ceiling, after everything is back on track, he pushes forward with the sole intention of finding Pito. Gon's confrontation with Pito is when things really begin to fall apart for him. Not only does Gon's grief take over his mind, causing his rage to flare up in a horrifying dark aura, 
but he lashes out at Kilua, who is trying to get Gon to think clearly. With the unexpected revelation about Komogi, Gon has difficulty processing his grief. He can only think of Kite, and how unfair it is that Pito is saving Komogi after what she did to him. The pained look on Gon's face in this scene nearly matches that of the king's face when he is feeding on an innocent child in an earlier chapter, but instead of reveling in his increasingly beast-like behavior, Gon is in turmoil because he so desperately wants to let go of logic, and he nearly gives in. Gon questions why he should care about Komugi, and goes to attack Pito with John Ken Rock, but is stopped by Kilua. Gon then snaps at him, telling Kilua that he can remain calm because this has nothing to do with him, which clearly pains Kilua to hear, but he gets Gon to calm down by reminding him that their goal is to restore Kite, not kill Pito. Gon accepts this, but goes dead behind the eyes. He gives Pito one hour to heal Komugi, during which he will sit unmoving and focused. Gon sits here for some time, and while there are interesting insights from Pito and a tense interaction with Poof, I'd like to skip ahead to when Gon and Pito leave. Gon stuns Pito with his intuition that the operation on Komugi has finished, while Pito is still trying to buy some time. Then, Tagashi tricks the audience into thinking that maybe Gon isn't so different by having him state that he trusts Pito, only for Gon to then tell Knuckle and Kilua to use Komugi as a hostage as leverage over Pito. Knuckle is shocked by the cold calculation of Gon in this scene, once again reminding the audience of his uncharacteristic intensity. Gon and Pito then head out from the palace to Kite's location, with Pito's plan to kill Gon on pause due to Komugi's situation. The scene where Pito explains to Gon that Kite is already dead and cannot be brought back to life is where Gon truly breaks down and his inability to deal with overwhelming grief takes over him. Manga Chapter 305, titled Sorry, features a fantastic two-page spread showing the conflict within Gon. He goes back and forth, blaming himself and blaming Pito for Kite's death while begging for anyone to help Kite. Gon is unable to process Kite's death, and even when Pito begins healing, Gon clings to the false hope that Kite must be alive and Pito must be about to heal him. It is only after Pito says that he is going to kill Gon that Gon realizes Pito isn't even going to try and help Kite and unleashes all of his pain. Just like it was alluded to before the palace invasion, Gon states that he doesn't care what happens to him, showing that he's unable to forgive himself, and in the following chapter titled Relief, Gon transforms into a monstrously powerful adult version of himself. I always thought that transforming Gon into an adult in this final conflict as a way to deal with his grief was an interesting direction to conclude Gon's arc. It's almost as if the story is telling us that Gon's childlike personality and mental state no longer had a place in this story, that because he was forced to go through such hardships in his interaction with the ants, that he was forced to mature physically into an adult just to deal with it all. This section most overtly ties back to the idea of maturity, but we see that although Gon has transformed himself, he is still mentally a child without the capacity to deal with his grief appropriately. Thus, he is allowing himself to go out in a blaze of anger and hatred, with the sole purpose of killing Pito to free Kite's corpse from her puppetry without any care for what happens to him. Gon is brutal in this scene, demolishing Pito without any difficulty and beating her corpse until his hands are soaked in blood. It is after Kilua arrives, shocked and disturbed at what Gon has become, and concerned with the price Gon had to pay in order to achieve this power, that Gon loses an arm to the reanimated corpse of Pito. But, to top it all off, Gon says that he's actually a little happy that he lost his arm, so he can be like Kite in the end. Gon then takes his severed arm and plunges it into Pito's corpse, which is the most metal thing of all time, and finishes Pito off with one final John Ken Rock, saying that finally, Kite can sleep. The story of Gon's grief in this arc is really about the fall of a hero. It is about how we can allow ourselves to be shaped by the horrors that happen to us, and how those horrors can make us into true monsters ourselves. How Gon deals with his grief is tragic. He blames himself for Kite's condition and wants to die because of it. He pushes those closest to him away, and he loses who he truly is in his quest for revenge, and nearly kills an innocent girl in the process. We sympathize with Gon because we know him, and we know what he is going through, but he is not a hero in this story. He is a monster, someone we should be terrified of, and that leads me into the last theme I want to talk about, man versus beast. I wanted to push this last theme to the very end because I think it is a culmination of all the themes I have already touched on and plenty more I have not. 
The theme of man versus beast envelops this entire story. The early section with the ants focuses more so on man versus nature, with the chimera ants developing their individuality and humanity, which results in them viewing themselves as the superior beings on the planet who can dictate how they treat the environment they feel they rule over. After the similarity between the ants and humans has been fully established, the king is born, and with him, the overarching theme transforms from man versus nature to man versus beast. This story tries to hone in on what elements of personality, morals, and thought truly make one human, and veers away from the more environmental questions that were focused on during the NGL portion. I believe that this theme is most easily understood through the lens of Gon and Meruem's inverted journeys. Other characters in this arc certainly help to flesh it out and add their own elements, but for the sake of this video, I will be focusing primarily on Gon, Meruem, and Netero for this theme. What makes a human? Are humans truly different from beasts? These are the main questions asked by this arc, and the story tells us directly that humans are capable of behaving far worse than the ants. Gon is a human, becoming more beast-like as he is guided by his grief to simplistic emotions of rage and revenge. As I mentioned, we see multiple examples of characters referring to Gon as beast-like, but I also want to say that these seeds in Gon's personality had been planted long before this arc even began. We can look at multiple characters throughout the different arcs who all see Gon and worry about the kind of person he could become. All the way back at Heaven's Arena, after Wing teaches Gon about Nen, Wing questions whether or not he's awoken a terrible monster. In York New, Zepile reflects on the fact that Gon doesn't seem to care if something is good or bad, and during Greed Island, Tezgara says that he fears what Gon will grow up to be. The mentor figures in Gon's life have long worried about the kind of person Gon could become, and that goes to show that these beast-like traits were always just under the surface, and the events of the Chimera Ant arc are what allowed them to break through. If even Gon, the hero of this story, has the potential to succumb to monstrous behavior, then what hope does the rest of humanity have when faced with the same challenges? Gon's story isn't just one of innocence lost, or the incredible lengths one will go to when suffering from grief, but also about the underlying potential for horrific behavior that exists within us all. The King, on the other hand, is a different story. The King and Gon are two sides of the same coin, with Gon's animalistic side slowly taking over while the King's is slowly repressed on his journey of self-actualization. I've talked enough about Gon for the time being. For the rest of this section, I really want to focus on Meruem. The King begins as a prophesized creature, a being who exists only to conquer, with no need for an identity because his existence is absolute. He is a beast, with no sense of self, born only to serve his purpose, and he does so instinctually, without thought or care for those who would stand in his way. All beings are lesser than him, because he is the fittest. It is only through meeting Komagi, a young dunce plagued with misfortune, growing up blind and mistreated in an impoverished slave nation, yet who holds a talent greater than the king's, which begins a change in him. It starts as nothing more than an intriguing frustration, leading to the king spending much more time with Komagi than any other human before her. Through the development of a genuine relationship, the king comes to gain a sense of compassion for her, one that he does not understand and cannot come to terms with. This leads him to ask for her name, something he has never bothered to learn of any human before her. After Komagi tells him, she then asks what the king's name is, and he has no answer. He does not know who he is, rather, he only knows the role he was born to serve. He reconvenes with his royal guards, those closest to him, and asks what his name is. They have no answer for the king, but remind him of his great power, which is the only thing that truly matters. He accepts this truth, and it becomes something that he revels in, as it is all that he knows. Komagi may have a different kind of strength than he does, but it doesn't matter because he has control over life and death itself, which is all that matters to a beast. After that moment, he decides to kill Komagi now that he is done using their matches to kill time, but upon seeing her in danger, he acts on instinct to protect her, and then, against his own will, begins to comfort her. The king has come to care for someone other than himself, he places value in the life of a lesser being, someone so insignificant compared to his raw power that she should be meaningless like all the others. Yet, she is not. He sees merit to her life, though he cannot understand why. Next, 
the palace invasion begins. When Komagi is injured in the air assault by Netero and Zeno, the king's anger is enough to stun the men into inaction. They did not expect to find the king caring for a human when they arrived, and this revelation seems to particularly affect Zeno. Yet, the king gives these two intruders respect and allows them to fulfill their plan, so Netero takes the king away. When the king and Netero talk, the king says that he has come to see the merit in some human lives, although human society itself is a chaotic mess he wishes to rectify. He tempts Netero with a communist promise of equality for the population of humans he'd allow to live, equality for all instead of rule by rich idiots, but at the cost of violent conquest. Netero believes this is the king's human and ant side battling for control of his heart and cannot risk allowing the king to go through with it. Although, he says he has to act before he is swayed, which means he considered what the king said as a possible positive. The reason this was the king's ant and human sides acting at odds is because the king's human side was what led him to have sympathy for man, but his ant side, his beast side, is what allowed him to think of using genocidal practices in order to instill a sense of mercy upon mankind. So Netero does everything in his power to kill the king, resorting to the most malicious nature of humanity, far worse behavior than any beast could perform, in order to keep humans as the top species. This is when the king comes face to face with unrelenting malice, as I mentioned earlier, but this malice is a representation of all of humanity. Unwilling to sacrifice their superiority for even a potential benefit, humanity's cruelty comes from its uncompromising desire to stay on top of the food chain. We see montages of the rich eating well at lavish parties, while the poor starve in the streets. We see the use of horribly dangerous bombs in order to gain an advantage over other human societies, and then the willingness to prevent the creation of more bombs, but the unwillingness to get rid of the existing bombs. An unwillingness to surrender whatever slight leg up that makes them superior to others. The malice of mankind comes from needing to be the best. Netero is a reflection of that. He is the superman of this world, needing to prove his strength against the kings, and in defeat, he cannot concede but needs to take his opponent with him. The malice of humanity means that it will destroy itself in the end, as long as it can take everything else with it. This is what the king realizes in his last moment. The game was over before it had even begun. The king is saved and reverts back to his previous mindset, having lost his memories, although he seems to have matured with the experience, both in power and a more merciful mindset. While Poof tries to convince the king that his existence is what Poof desires it to be, a superior being meant to rule this world, the king feels there is something missing. Upon hearing Komugi's name, it all comes flooding back to him. With the death of Yupi and Poof's obvious illness, he has realized that he isn't long for this world and sees that there is no point in continuing down his path for dominance, although he does lament what he could have done for the world given his near godlike power. As a mortal being, brought down to reality by the efforts of one man and understanding human compassion due to his time with Komugi, he accepts his death and merely wants to spend his remaining time with the person he cares for and who cares for him. In his last moments, the king realizes what purpose he was truly born for. He was born to be here, to make the happiest moment of Komugi's life possible. He dies, wanting to be recognized as an individual, not as a title. He dies, wanting to be called by his name. What is a human? It's something other than just DNA or how one was raised. Through Gon and Netero, we are shown the bottomless malice that humanity is capable of. A terrified species of individuals, flailing their power at anything that frightens them, including others of their own kind. Gon becomes more like a beast than the innocent child he started out as because of the grief and infinite despair he feels. He becomes a monster to get revenge on a monster. Netero is the embodiment of human drive to be the best, always pushing himself and seeking a challenge. Yet. When he comes face to face with an enemy he has no hope of defeating on his own, that desire for a challenge transforms into malice. The king's kindness to Netero angers him, and instead of accepting his defeat and recognizing the superiority of another, Netero detonates a bomb in his chest to take his opponent down with him. What is a human? A human is capable of being far worse than a beast. But to be human, one doesn't have to be born human. While some of the most beast-like behavior in this arc comes from humans, some of the most human behavior comes from beasts. The king is the perfect example of that. His journey is to go from a wild animal, 
feasting on innocence and merely serving his role, to a compassionate individual seeking the warmth of companionship in his final moments. It is through the king that we see the other side of humanity, what makes the species worthy of protecting and even being inspired by. It is through the king that we learn more about Komugi and see the joy of a simple life without greed or hatred, but one where passion is at the center. Even in the face of Netero, the king cannot help but commend the old man for the years of effort he must have put into becoming the formidable warrior that he is. And even Yupi comes to see Knuckle and Moral as worthy opponents whose drive and dedication to their mission make them deserving of mercy. While at their lowest, humans are capable of unspeakable evil. We see example after example of that within this arc, but the story concludes not with Gon's transformation nor Netero's bombing, but instead with a beast who has come to accept his own humanity, spending his last moments with a friend, doing something that they loved together. That is the main theme of this arc. Man and beast are two different elements of the human heart. I think that I've talked her ear off just about enough, but please indulge me for just a few moments longer. The reason that I made this video was to sort through my own thoughts on this incredibly intense and frankly too long for some arc in the hopes that my own dissection of the themes presented could help others gain a new appreciation or better understanding of the story. While this may be your favorite arc, or one you think is overrated to downright dull, I believe that this arc is still the creation of a brilliant artist who had something he wanted to say after decades of work wielding his pen. This storyline truly got dark and more mature than anything Hunter x Hunter has attempted before, and I think that's worthy of praise, but I think that sometimes the light gets overwhelmed by the darkness when people speak about this arc. I greatly appreciate the narrative for diving into more thematic topics, going into a darker realm for the sake of the characters and the narrative, rather than just to appeal to a new crowd or be edgy. For me, although this tone isn't what I think of when I think of why I love Hunter x Hunter, the messages of the story and how uniquely cynical and yet innocently sincere it all is, makes this one of the most impactful stories I have ever watched or read. There is so much more I can say about the story here, but it's time for me to show you insane people still watching this some mercy and bring the video to an end. Thank you so much for watching this video. After binging this arc in two different mediums over the last month, I do need a bit of a break from Hunter x Hunter, but I will be finishing up this thematic breakdown series with the chairman election arc sometime toward the end of this winter. Likely, I will release the video at the beginning of March. Sorry for such a long wait, but I will have plenty of other videos coming out between then, so if you like this one, please consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on what's coming in the future. Thank you so much for watching this entire thing, you crazy, crazy kids. I really appreciate it, and until the next time, I'll shut up.